Pardon, blimey, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat. Let's try that again. Hello and welcome to On The Ledge Podcast. In this week's show, we're looking at living stones, a.k.a. lithops, and I answer a question about plants for bathrooms with no natural light. Thank you to Leah for becoming a patron of On The Ledge. Yes, Leah, you are now a legend. And thanks to Amy Lou Hu, who left a lovely review on Apple Podcasts for the show. I had a bit of bad news this week and it really cheered me up to hear your kind words about the show. And one of the things you said is that wandering at our natural world together with fellow listeners is one of the highlights of my week. Oh, that's so nice to hear. Thank you, Amy Lou Hu. And if you want to leave a review for On The Ledge, go ahead, treat yourself your pod app of choice hopefully we'll have a review option so that's a great way of letting others know what you think of the show and if you have a twitter account but you're sick of the fighting and the politics then you need houseplant hour in your life the next one's happening on november the 5th 2019 at 9 p.m gmt that's uk time please join me for an hour of chatting about our plants uh you can follow me at jane perone there's also at houseplant hour and throughout we use the hashtag houseplant hour so you can follow every everything and I'd love to see you there. Come and say hi. I travelled to the Peak District recently and visited Sally Williams' wonderful Peperomia collection and she suggested that I popped in to see Jill and Brian Fern of Abbey Brook Cactus Nursery near Matlock who are the holders of another very different national collection of lithops aka living stones. Abbey Brook was the first commercial nursery in the world to declare in 1963 that it wouldn't deal in field collected material. So they were very ahead of their time in terms of awareness of environmental issues surrounding cacti and succulents. And it was an absolute delight to chat to Brian and Jill about these plants and answer some of your questions about their care, because I know it's a plant that a lot of people have a lot of questions about, and I hope they'll be answered in this episode. And Brian really is an authority on these plants. The nursery has been going for more than 60 years and Brian has been studying lithops since he was a student of botany at Sheffield University. And in fact, Brian showed me his master's degree thesis awarded by Sheffield University in 1969 entitled The Taxonomy and Phytogeography of the Genus Lithops. And as you'll hear, Brian and Jill were absolutely delightful interviewees. And despite the fact that Brian's eyesight is going, he is still sharp as a tack and full of information about these fascinating plants. So come with me as we enter one of the glass houses at Abbey Brook. Oh, wow. We didn't put on a good glass last way today. Oh, well, this is, I'm already in absolute heaven. What can I say? Ah. (laughs) <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm recording. So Don't cacti. worry. I'm already. I have got some cacti. Nothing at all like this. I probably have about twenty-five cacti. So yeah, and only <laughs> one lithops. Well, I said to Jill, I've always wanted a big one. Yeah, and this is it. I know. <laughs> wow, it's that is a two, large two, golden two barrel. One meters in circumference. Yeah. Does anyone ever I'll like just butt in here to say there, we, we had to pass some know. amazing plants to get to the Lithops collection, yeah, including yeah, this yeah, huge careful, golden yeah, barrel yeah. cactus. <laughs> but once we did get there, the first thing that I spied was an incredible display of mixed Lithops wow. in a bowl. Oh, wow. That's gorgeous. So we've got here, I'm just going to describe this for the listeners, this lovely large terracotta pan, would you call that a pan, Um, filled with lithops. And it looks like a painting almost uh, with a beautiful, how many different species have we got in there or cultivars Um, do we have there? Probably about 40 uh, 40 or 50. I've forgotten now. Um, It's won first prize in two national shows now. Okay. Um, the, the shows are every four years, so uh, that was 19, uh, 2016 and 2012 um, that I won first prize with that bowl. <laughs> and it's been on television this yeah, year. Yeah, that, that was the one that was uh, exhibited in the RHS show at Chatsworth. 
you do have to look twice because there are some. St- uh, this is a brilliant illustration of why they're called stone plants because you do have to look twice because there are some stones in there yeah. that you look can, very much like the lithops. You can walk on these plants mm. and not, not, because you don't know they're there. Yes, because they're ju- just like that. You're walking on the pebbles. Yeah, uh, um, but not the plants. That's a lovely way of displaying them because it's really showing off. You can look from one to another and see the different characteristics and colours, and it really does look stunning. Do they ever grow like this in nature, where you'll see one species next to another? Oh, or, or, oh no, or, no, 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 no. You'll... What one site might be the size of a tennis court. Right. That's it. And, yeah. just and, you've got a, and yeah, that's one species, and then you go... 50 kilometres to find another. Right. And there's 200,000 square miles of South Africa where these grow. So uh, the number of sites, when I was working on them, there was 246, mm-hmm. right? There are now over 500. Oh, right. Yeah, that's in 40 years. So mm-hmm. we've, we found another 200-odd in the, in the last um, 40 years. Mm. And they're still finding them. Yes. But well, I guess as you... had never been to South Africa, you know, all the years he'd worked on this option. Mm. I said to him, when I retire... We're going. Yes. We're going. And we went, uh, this was 2006, and fortunately there was a conference that year in South oh. Africa, in Calixtorp. Mm. So we went to the conference and they'd organised a pre-conference trip round Namibia, oh, wending wow. your way well, south well, from Windhoek right down to, well, down, right down to Cape Town. We went, oh, we went wow. down to Cape Town. Six, oh, six yeah. weeks we spent. Yeah. Uh, sounds amazing. I was, I was giving was a paper at the conference mm-hmm. as well on Lithop, mm-hmm. so that was... You must have been in heaven that whole time. Oh, just... oh yes. Yes, I bet you were just in your element, enjoying, I enjoying the, 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 the first time you saw this up, so it, and it was it was amazing, wasn't it? <laughs> and, and I always almost gave up hope of ever finding any af- after that because they were actually literally underground. Mm. You know, they've got dust mm. on top of them, mm. and you, the only way you could tell they were there would be there would be a little outline, a little mm. crack. Because we, 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 we were in the, the dry season, was. and then right. somebody <laughs> would blow the dust off, and there uh-huh. they were. Yeah. yeah. Oh well, that must have been a really special trip. It was. We're, it, we've, anyway, look, we've got a, look, as far as the eye can see, almost it is lithops. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, from I think um, oh four hundred sites. Uh, there's 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 some you know, uh, and these have been grown. There, there isn't a field collector plant there. They've all been grown from seed. Mm-hmm. I've grown the whole lot from mm-hmm. seed. And when I told my listeners that I was coming to see you and asked them for their questions about lithops, the thing that came up over and over and over again was watering. Some people have been told that they should never water their lithops. Some people have worried they're overwatering. Can you give us chapter and verse on how to water these plants successfully? Right, you, you water them from um, the end of March or April mm-hmm. until the end of September. Okay. Absolutely no water at all during the winter. Okay. In habitat, um, they they grow virtually within sight of the sea, mm. uh, and up to uh, I think it was uh, six thousand feet uh, in altitude. Right. Um, and the ones near the sea in 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 Namibia, they don't get any rain. <laughs> It's just sea fogs, so those are the most difficult ones Uh ones to grow. But we water these once a week or through the summer, Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, they get a a fair amount of water. And do you water from the top? Does it matter whether you water? No, no, water from the top. Yep. Um, And uh, they, they get nutrients, but not very much. Uh, and and they, they exist. And they're sitting on on uh, a bed of sand. Sand. Yeah. So obviously, any stray moisture is being wicked right yeah. away. So yeah. if somebody was growing this yeah. as as a, as a plant indoors, presumably that's one thing to be aware of: is that water isn't being allowed to pool underneath and Absolutely. sit there. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. you can actually plant them up in decorative bowls, and they look very mm. nice. But I always recommend that people put a good inch of gravel. In yeah. the bottom of the bowl. And what's the potting mix for these oh, when you're looking sand, at... Sandy mix. Yeah, yeah just about, very free fussy. draining. Yeah, not it's fussy. about 50% though, sand. It's a more no. sandy mix than we use for, for most of the rest So 50-50 perhaps a sandy mix and some kind of potting compost. Potting compost. Potting, yeah. Yeah. 
you know, if somebody is starting off a collection and wants to, to grow lithops, are there any sort of starter species or cultivars that are super easy that people should start with? Those, that... those that come from, say, Johannesburg, Peshawar, this is um, um, western parts, no, eastern parts of, of the, the Cape, you know, South Africa, because uh, that's a higher rainfall area. Right. So they, they can stand extra water. Uh -huh. It's the ones from Namibia at the other end where you've got to be careful that, mm -hmm. um, you know, what's yeah, that one? That's fulvisaps. Fulvisaps, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, actually, a, uh, no a campier is a better example. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. oh, yes, look at that. So that's. Let, I'm just going to consult the They've label here. Quite big those as well. Lithops alcampii um, form curuman, and that's quite a big one, isn't yeah. it? That's oh, quite yeah. a large sort of uh, conker oh, size forms, almost. Yeah, it forms and, a big clump. Right. You know, uh, nine a decent. Inch diameter, you know, sort of. And the form of these, what, what's the what's the evolutionary reason? Can you explain the, why these plants look? I mean, the, the, as my my nine year old son would say, "Mum, they look a bit like a bum." Yes. <laughs> what, yeah, what's yeah, the yeah. evolutionary explanation for how they it's, look? It's um, it's two leaves attached to a root, right? And that's that's basically all all these are, and the growing point is is at the base of the two leaves. Which produces either the flowers or a new, a new growth. Mm -hmm. They produce new pair of leaves every year. Okay. Um, and does that? Or well, nearly every year. Well, it does that be, it come up? Every year. Does that appear? So it clumps Fruit, out it by. Clumps out. Look, and and they're, they're so economical mm. that all the water in the old old leaves are absorbed by the new pair of leaves coming through. So oh. they're not wasted. Okay. Not so that's coming through the centre. Yes. And yes. Uh, so I, I've occasionally seen people on Facebook asking, "What's happening to my lithops? It's going all weird." And th uh, so the explanation is, it's just growing. Yeah. <laughs> so, so oh, that, there we are. There's, yes. there's, there's, there's an old the old leaf, one. and it's just like a very dry economical, skin. as you say. Yeah. It's yeah. all that brown yeah. stuff. So that's yeah. the old leaf that's just being it. sloughed away. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and um, and the nutrients uh, out of that are absorbed. Just taken back in, no, nothing wasted. No, yeah, no. Oh, well, that's very clever. Uh, nobody's explained to me how. Um, how they the, do the it. Plant, <laughs> that, yeah, because they've obviously got to reverse the water flow yeah. in, in yeah. the xylem material. Right. Yeah. With, that's with, with you know, with, which is normally only on one one, one way. way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is that they 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 shrink into the ground in the dry season. Mm -hmm. And they've got contractile roots, so the yeah, the roots actually pull, pulling pull them down. down. Pulling down. So when, 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 the, when the, in other words, when the compost is is wet, it's it's you know uh, they can't do that if it's if, if it's dry and solid. Mm, mm. The, the, the contractile roots will uh, will act. You know, d during the the end of yeah. the, the end of the wet season. Yeah, they, they've got these spiral rings of xylem yes. inside the yes. vessels. Yeah. And that's, and how, that, they and do that's it. how they do it. It's like a spring. So in the winter when you're not watering these plants, should you be concerned if they start shriveling slightly? Is there anything to worry about? No, no. You, could, you could miss them. Some people do mm. just spray them a bit. And actually, Brian, Brian doesn't give them enough water, I think. You know, so I go around <laughs> watering them when he's not there. <laughs> but, but presumably they're so but tough that they will they'll they'll bounce you, back. You have to be careful. You, you mm. obviously don't give them very much. You just give them a little shower, as it were. Mm. Mm. There's just what I love about these plants is just although they all in some one sense look the same, the variety in different shades of grey and terracotta and brown and green and cream is so beautiful. Yeah. And then no, you've also yeah. got the flowers as well. Yeah. It, yeah. It, the, the colours, it, it's not like a chameleon. The plant can't change its colour. What it's what it's done is ev evolve the colour by. Um, produ producing a range of colours in a habitat, mm -hmm. uh, and the ones that don't match are picked out by rodents or birds or what have you. Uh, and so you, eventually you get, you get um, a, a relatively uniform basic colour in, in any particular habitat yeah. that matches mm -hmm. its surroundings. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, you know, these sorts of things. You think green. Oh, yeah, well, they'll match the grass that they grow. No, they don't grow in grass. <laughs> no. But they grow in green rocks. Mm, mm. 
Yeah, that's a lovely. This one, um, Helmutai, that's a lovely one. And uh, again, some of them are quite relatively large. And then there are some really teeny, teeny, tiny ones. I mean, gosh, I don't know if that gets much bigger than that. Uh, Halli, Halli, but (laughs) but there are even in your selection there are some very small ones. Yeah, you must. Very close is a small one, and and these are quite small as well. These stay very small. And the flowers, do they uh, appear at a particular time of year? Oh, autumn. So we're here at the right. They're they're just starting to flower. Yes, there's one group that starts in July. Um, and and uh, but the majority of it, it's uh, it's September in the UK. It's September October. And do the, are in those, so, in but South in South Africa, Africa there, it's April May. It's April oh, right, because it's right. seasons reversed. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And do those flowers are they sort of bursting out and around for a very short amount of time just for pollination, and then they disappear just to oh, keep the plant um, incognito? They're in flower probably for a week. Okay. A week. Or, and they, or an individual and, and often, flower loss. Uh, often, it's really the only time when people have found the plants. Of course, because they're, they're yeah, actually they're visible they're for one. Yes, yes, yes. Well, there was a lady in in uh, south uh, in south in in Namibia. Um, she had a, a, a farm covering twenty thousand hectares. That's a big farm. Mm, a um, big and, farm. And, 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 that supported only a hundred head of cattle. But she got um, what one lithop locality she found. Mm. But it took her four years <laughs> to find the next one. And she just happened to be in the right place at the right time when things were in flower. So she mm. could see it. You've got to be in it for the long game. You can't be looking for something. You can't be. So if you're studying these plants in their wild, wild environment, I imagine you've got to be incredibly patient and persistent. We'll be back with more Lithops chat shortly. But first, a little detour into the inner sanctum of my brain. Uh, I've been thinking about emojis a lot recently and the fact that the emojis that we as planty people have at our disposal are just not good enough. And so I've been cooking up a plan with my able assistant, Kelly Westlake, to put this right. I had a chat with Kelly earlier this week to discuss our first steps and we quickly realised that getting a new planty emoji made might be more difficult than we'd initially thought. Kelly, hello, welcome to On The Ledge. Hello. This is um, wonderful to actually have you on the show. You're working away, beavering away in the background, sending out messages to listeners and doing all kinds of useful stuff for me. So it's really nice to actually hear your voice on the show. Um, let's talk a little bit about this crazy idea that I've had. This is the kind of thing I do, isn't it? I have crazy ideas and then expect somebody else to, um, help me make them happen. You do. (laughs) Um, I, I think this, as all good things on podcasts do, I think this came from listening to a podcast about, um, emojis and the emojis that don't exist. Yeah. And it occurred to me that plant emojis as somebody who uses these quite a lot, are quite, there's not that many, there's not, we haven't got many choices out there. And I, I roped you into doing some research about how we can get a particular plant emoji onto our smartphones. Um, can you reveal to the listeners what that emoji is? Well, have we already decided on the plant itself? Obviously, it's going to be um, uh, uh, some form of house plant. Are you going to go with, with what we've been talking about or are we going to put it out to the vote? Well, I think I think there's only one choice, really. I mean, I think there's, well, there's possibly two choices. I think the options are a monster relief, which is so iconic. I think that's got to be up there. The other one I did think about was maybe a Venus flytrap, but I think that the monster would be more widely used. I mean, what we should say is, is that one would like to think that this was a really easy thing and you could just sort of say, please, can we have a monster emoji? And it would happen. But you've, I've got you to do some digging into this as to how we might go about 
finding out more information about this. Uh, but it's not that straightforward, is it, from what we found so far? No, it is not that simple. And it is quite a laborious, drawn out process. A lot of fun, I imagine, along the way, though. But this can take a good couple of years to come to fruition. That's oh if we ever got that far, because obviously people are proposing all the time and not everybody gets through. So yeah, it's, it's very official. There's um, a proper proposal process. Uh, and it has to go to what's known as the Unicode code consortium in the bay area in california um, and they meet four times a year to consider proposals which can be made by absolutely anyone anywhere in the world now they do submit proposals internally i think there's something like seven multinationals on the panel including as you might imagine huge tech giants so we're talking adobe we're talking ibm uh, the likes of those companies um, but anyone else anywhere in the world if you've got an idea you can submit but they do put you through your paces they do make you jump through hoops and you really do have to justify your cause so what are we going to need to make this happen i guess we're going to need first of all a reason why monster relief should be on there i think that's fairly obvious to anyone who listens to this podcast it's it's something that we want to kind of have a shorthand for in fact i've been writing all these uh, patreon cards for my patreon subscribers and I mean, I guess I'm out of the habit. I apologise in advance for my horrendous handwriting. And I've been writing things and then like almost wanting to do an emoji and then realise I'm handwriting something and thinking, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> How digital have I got? But I think uh, the argument for the monster emoji is that it's something that would be very well used by lots of plant people, is very distinctive. And we all know what it looks like. I think the other thing we might need, though, Kelly, is somebody to actually design the emoji. And I'm thinking that, this is going to be okay because I think we've got lots of listeners with kind of graphic design skills, fingers crossed. Because you or me, what's your drawing skills like? Terrible, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish I wish it were otherwise, but we, we would have to submit quite decent artwork because sometimes proposals fall down because of the quality or lack of of the imagery that's submitted with the proposal. So, uh, yeah, it has to be pretty good. It's often advised that it looks like um, other imagery out there. So Apple imagery, Google imagery, it has that kind of clean feel about it. I think some people have submitted clunky clip art type uh, artwork in the past. It doesn't do you any favours. OK, OK. So we need a, we need we need somebody to help us out with that side of things. And I guess really the other thing we need is sort of people to come up with with very cogent arguments about why why this needs to be an emoji. Perhaps we need some, I don't know, perhaps we need a sort of a, once we get further down the line, a sort of a really good list of a monster emoji would change my life. You know, users backing us up with that information. I think this is something we need to move forward. I mean, I'm sorry that I've landed you with this like two year mission, Kelly, but hopefully um, it'll be something that we can follow along with and, and find out what's going to, uh, it'll be kind of interesting to, to see how this whole process works. Maybe we should put a vote out to, to listeners though, to tell us if they like the idea of, of going for monster or if they think there's some other leaf or carnivorous plant or something that's more deserving i don't know something to bear in mind is that it, it can't be too specific but it also can't be too vague which is a okay. fine balance to strike it also has to have universality so whatever image we go for will have to be recognized all over the world okay well uh, well let's let's have a little consultation maybe on the facebook group and see what listeners think about this and hopefully they'll agree with us that monster is a good one to go for or perhaps we'll be swayed by a, a venus flytrap argument but i think this is a good place to start and and let's see where it takes us we could be in california in two years time talking to unicode <laughs> it is a nice thought so there you go. We are on the road to getting a new emoji added to the rather too brief list of plant emojis out there. But we want to know what emoji that should be. So please pop along to my On The Ledge Facebook page, Houseplant Fans of On The Ledge, where I'll be garnering your opinions. Or if you're not on Facebook, just drop me a line to On The Ledge Podcast at gmail.com with your vote. Should we go for a monster relief? a venus flytrap or something else entirely and we will be keeping you posted on our progress and indeed if you are a graphic designer or maybe you work at unicode who knows then give me a shout and you can get on board with this special on the ledge mission and now let's head back to abbey brook where i've got a few more questions about lithops 
And how easy are these to grow for, from seed? Because every year on the podcast, I have a, a, a sow along event where I encourage people to sow seeds, and lots of people choose cacti and succulent seeds to sow, and lots of people choose lithops with varying results. Some people have had great success, others not so much. Is there any right you, advice? You, you sow the seeds <laughs> on the surface. Right. Okay. Are they tiny? Are they very small? They are like dust. Well, some, okay. S- some yes. are like dust. A lot of them. Um, and, and others are um, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you might be able to <laughs> just <laughs> big, yeah, big. Um, a millimeter. Right. Uh, but um, sort of fifteen thousand seeds in a, in a cubic centimeter is the. Oh my is gosh. The, is the, That's is a lot the of dust. <laughs> <like>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't um, have to sneeze so when you the the No. The surface, <laughs> Um, don't cover them with compost because they need light for germination. Okay. Uh, so you can't do it in the in the, the airing cover, is it? Well, okay. Um, and um, they they'll germinate within two two weeks, three two or three weeks. Uh, and <clears throat> don't don't try to um, transplant them until they're at least twelve months old. Okay. De Boer used to. Um, well, you can sow the seed in the spring, right? Okay. You can also sow it in the autumn. Okay. Um, and De Boer in Holland, he used to sow his in the autumn, and he used to keep them going for 18 months and then transplanted them in after they were 18 months old in, in the second year. So in a way, quite an e- in a way, that's quite good because I find when you're growing certain plants that you 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 you, you sow them and then you've got fifty plants to prick out two months later and you've got nowhere to put oh, them. No, Whereas no, at least no, no, yeah. no, with no. the lithops, they can sit there, sit there. doing their own thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm quite happy. I mean, um, I, without I, you I'll having to find some seedlings for you. Too. Yeah, well, that would be interesting. Um, and are there any favourites here, Brian, that you really? Ooh, you you, ooh, you just think um, you're just drawn to. But Fulvis Epsi is nice. Um, Fulvis. Fulvis Epsi. Let's uh, have a look. A, I think that was one we... Did we have... There, um, Fulvis Epsi. Fulvis Epsi. It's got big... Oh, yes, this is Fulvis Epsi. There's one here. There's a few there different Fulvis Epsi here, yes. Look there. It's very pretty, like, yeah, um, with the yellow flower. they got flower. coming up. Yes. Um, they've got big spots on the top. Mm. Um, and uh, you know, nice colours. Did the flower colour vary to, from species to species? These yellow, I see some white here. It's yellow. Um, if it's they're yellow or white. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, usually, the green ones are white flowered, mm-hmm. and all the other brown ones are yellow flowered. But that's as a general rule. I love this uh, Doroth- Dorothea. Dorothea. Yes. Um, that yes. is. The colouring, I mean, it it's looks nice. like somebody's it painted nice. on. Yes. It's a very red, pale grey-green, and then someone's painted on with a paintbrush, bright, well, mm-hmm. d- dark red yes. and dark yes. grey. That's yes. incredible, like yes. in a sort of an amazing vein pattern. Yes. That's a real, I lo- that's, that's my favourite so far. But yeah. every one of them, it's, it's, I can imagine it being a mindfulness exercise, just staring at one of these pots for half an hour. <laughs> that would be very relaxing. Um, <laughs> we're walking further down to look at, look at more. And uh, again, there's just so much variation between the different species. Do you find that when people come and look at your collection, what are the m- most common things that people say? Do, are people surprised that they're even plants? Sometimes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, um, when the when the bowl had been at the show at mm. Chatsworth, Jill <laughs> said a lady was looking at the plant and she parked her handbag on the bowl because <laughs> she didn't realise there were any plants there. Oh, it's good they're tough then. <laughs> they, they weren't bothered well, by. Yeah, well, as I say, you can walk on these plants and not not yeah. uh, damage them because yes. they're usually just a, a little At bit below level. the surface. And this is one thing I did want to ask actually, because I I had I the the lithops that I was given, I repotted because I was worried that the potting mix was not ideal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was a bit nervous about the the height at which I should plant them, whether I should bury them right up to the, the, the sort of the top surface or whether I should leave them a little bit proud. Does it vary from species to species how you treat them in that regard? Um, well, n- normally you, you don't bury the plants. Mm. Um, <clears throat> um, th- if you just 
put the compost just a little bit above, you know, where the join is mm -hmm. between the, the, the leaves of the root. Um, <clears throat> and you can put some more top dressing on. The, the uh, plant with its stomata, mm -hmm. it gives you the clue. There's no stomata at all on the top surface. Oh, OK. Um, the top surface uh, often is dark because the light hasn't reflected it's gone straight into the plant right because the the wind the there's a window at there's the top. a window okay because the photosynthetic tissue there's none on the top at all mm -hmm. aligning the inside of the root of the leaf mm -hmm. and all the cells in the center of the the, the plant are are colorless Mm -hmm. So the light passes straight through, mm -hmm. and, and it's photosynthetic from the inside rather than from the mm -hmm. outside. So when it's buried in the ground, uh, it'll still work. The stomata, there's again no stomata mm -hmm. on, the, on the top surface at all. The stomata in the groove, and the stomata in a ring round oh, the outside of the, you know, um, and uh, uh, camp plants, in that uh, they they the stomata open at night, yep, and are closed during the day. Well, we love a bit of cam on on the ledge podcast, as regular listeners will know. We're always, I'm always, I just, I love being able to say it. Crassulation acid metabolism it makes me sound so clever, but it's also so fascinating the the way these plants are adapted to deal with the harsh conditions they live in, and that's a brilliant explanation. So, I'm presumably for that reason, I don't want to bury them too deep because then I would be burying the stomata that are around well, the inner ring. Yeah, around. But the, the oh, the contractile roots, compost. though, as well. Presumably, they might. Oh. They might move up and down of their own accord anyway. Yes. yes. Right. So I don't yes. have to. That's great that yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. Um, and we've got these seedlings here. So presumably, when you're sowing those seeds, the, the, the um, spacing of those seedlings suggests to me that you're sowing very, very thinly. Yes. How do you achieve such thin sowing when the seeds are so small? Do you have to cut it with sand? Do you cut the seeds with sand, or are you just very careful? Just careful. Yeah. Just careful. Yeah. Oh, they're beautiful. They're so cute. Yeah, um, I mean, the other thing is, you, 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 your seeds are probably measured in numbers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you can judge how many, you know, yeah. the size of where you're going to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Know, if you've got 100 seeds, um, a pot that size mm -hmm. for 100 seeds is fine because mm -hmm. they're going to remain there for 12 months. Of course, yeah. Minimum. Yeah. yeah. So well, we, you, you we, can... we, we put 60 seeds in, in our seed packet. Yeah. Yes, yeah, the yeah. So, okay. Um, it's about a sort of cup, you know, a uh, yeah, um, full, is Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now, some of them, um, like these, you see, have got a proper window. Yes, that is more like the, the fenestraria, isn't it? The, yes. the window is very obvious yeah. on those ones. Um and, uh, and that's uh, olivacea, which olivacea, is which is olive yes. coloured, which yes. is nice. <laughs> and they look yes. a bit like olives, actually. Yeah. The shape. It is a it is a very olive green. I mean, mm. that's the other thing. I mean, the plants look slightly different colours mm. when you see them in habitat because they're of much course. more baked. And mm. and I mean, even in habitat, if you see a plant underneath another another plant or a bush, mm -hmm. it looks much brighter in colour mm. than the one that's out in full mm -hmm. sun. Yeah. I mean, it gets yeah. really really hot because the, the the rocks that they're in. You know, yes. Well, you, yeah. You know, you, you can't. Well. You can't touch you them. Can't put your hand on a hot day. Oh is wow! It, they're hot. that hot. Yeah. That hot. Yeah. What an incredible plant! I mean, that just is mind blowing that they can survive that kind of temperature. Uh, probably, um, oh, 50, 60 centigrade. So, what's going to kill these plants is not baking heat. It's going to be somebody leaving them on a shady windowsill in the wrong potting mix yeah. and watering oh, yeah. them oh, too much. I, I had a phone call one morning. We got all sorts of nice phone calls from customers. But this, this guy, he was, a bit, he was complaining a bit. And he said, I bought some of those lithops plants from me a few weeks ago. And I said, yeah. Um, and he says, they're not growing. They're not doing anything. So we sort of talked a bit about them. And I said to him, um, where did you put them? Did you put them on a windowsill? And he said, no, they're, um, they're on a bookcase. So I said, are they near to light? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, they're near to, near to light. And I said, just had a sudden thought, and I said to him, what, did you, did, you did plant them, did you? Oh, do you have to plant them? <laughs> ah, OK. <laughs> 
that's where you're going wrong. <laughs> I guess some people think because they're called stone plants, yeah. they literally, literally yeah. are like yeah. stones, that's and they right. just and can sit there. <laughs> the rest of your decorative pebbles. <laughs> oh, that's well. I guess at least uh, he was, you, you put him right. I did. <laughs> And what about pests with these? Are there any mealybug? Are they mealybug magnets or mm, any other problems well, like that? No, it's baboons. Oh, well, you mean in the wild? <laughs> <laughs> I don't got many baboons. No, I think I'm okay for baboons. I think that will probably not be a problem in my greenhouse, but yeah. <laughs> well, it's, you know, uh, it's that sort of thing in habitat. Okay. Um, and goats. And goats. Oh, goats. I can imagine yeah. goats. Yeah, goats. Goats, yeah, goats nibble them. Chew the top off. We get mice. So in, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> in a baboon and goat free mice, environment, mice. you might have. Uh, we, we might have mice. mice. But I guess there's not much for, for even for a mealy bug, there's not actually much for them to go for, is there? Um, oh, compared no, to. Oh, it's a pair of leaves and. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, we do get a bit of. Um, we, I mean, there, we. There are some mouse traps, by the mm. way. Yeah, yeah oh, I can imagine I've got mice I'll in pull my that shed. I one out of the way because I cut my fingers and it got my oh, fingers cut. Yeah, no, I, my, mice are an issue. Yeah, yeah. They, they eat the plants, they eat yeah. the seeds. They like the fofferers the best. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, they okay. love the fofferers. <laughs> well, I mean, these are all arranged in alphabetical order. Uh-huh. You know, from one end to the other, rather than sight ones, mm -hmm. uh, which is much more... So that would be, that would be complicated, complicated, I imagine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, everything, by the way, is double labelled. If somebody comes along and takes all the labels out, there's always another one in the pot. Oh, well, that's, that's very good. And I guess when you've got a national collection, that's what the kind of uh, doubling up I've that learned, you need to do. I've learned from long practice. Yeah, I'm sure. And <laughs> tell me about just pot size with these, because you've got them in various size pots. Are they plants that like to be nicely root bound and not really bothered about being repotted particularly often? Yeah, well, these haven't been done for 10 years. Yeah, so they're not. <laughs> Not something. So really, they're very low maintenance all round. By the sound of it, yeah. I mean, do they like a cold, colder spell in the winter? Do you, if oh, if you're growing them inside, five centigrade. If I was know. growing them in my house, would I be moving them to an unheated porch then, or somewhere where they could get that lower temperature, or would they be okay at twenty degrees centigrade all year? Oh no, year? that's too high. Too high. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if we've got them in a, a normal living room, yeah. an unheated room is a good choice yes. in come yeah. winter. Okay. Yeah. Uh, light levels are not that important in the winter. Right. So you uh, don't have uh, to worry about them. You move them. You move them to where uh, um, light levels are very important in the growing season. Mm. Uh, it's got to be high light. But do you have to be careful when you say you've got put them in a lower light situation, you've got a plant that's growing in your house and in the winter you want to move it to an unheated <laughs> room. Do you have to be careful with um, exposure to light again? Do they do they get a bit soft no. in the winter no, or they're not no, bothered? Because no, no, no. I know I've had, I've had well, that with a few the, cacti where they've moved from one place the, to another. They've the probably um, got still the old pair of leaves uh -huh. and the, there's a new pair coming through. Mm -hmm. uh, in the late late winter, early spring, <coughs> yeah. and um, you, you just um, uh, have to, uh, you know, bye bye, um, you know, those, those those sort of things. Okay. Well, I'm delighted to see this glorious collection <laughs> that's stretching in both directions a, a long way, and in this impressive glass house full of other amazing cactus treasures i'm going to end it here on lithop so i'm going to continue wandering around because it's so this is where it stops well that was great fun meeting brian and jill and learning loads about lithops if you want to see some of the things that we talked about and that incredible lithops bowl then do go to my show notes at janeperone.com for a good look and now it's time for question of the week this week, Julie wants to know about plants for bathrooms with no windows. She is lucky enough to have two bathrooms, and but neither of them has uh, any natural light coming in. And she wants to put plants in them, so she's wondering what she can do that will work. The obvious answer would be, I'm afraid you can't have plants, but I think there are actually some ways around this problem. For a start, is your bathroom really completely free of natural light? If you leave the door open most of the time, then and there's light from another room coming into that room, you may find that actually there is some light in that room. So it may be that you just want to have a few different plants that you swap in and out of the bathroom 
leaving each one there for say a month or two and then swapping them out and moving them somewhere else around the house so they don't suffer in the long term from lack of light and the kind of things you might be looking at for this purpose might be something like the double z plant there is a story i read once of somebody who put one of these plants the zamiococcus zamifolia into a cupboard for six months and got it out uh, and it had no light and looked exactly the same so this is a very tough plant that would probably be fine i mean if you want to just have a few zamiococcus that you switch in and out uh that would probably be a good way of dealing with it. Uh, you could also have something like a Saxifragia stolonifera. That would probably be fine for a shortish while, a couple of months in there with not a lot of light. And the great thing about that plant is you can propagate it really easily. So you could end up with quite a few different plants that serve their time in your dark bathroom. If you want to expand the range of plants that you've got in there, I think you're going to be needing to look at a grow light option. Bathrooms, well, that can be a little bit difficult if you've got uh, a lamp fitting, a wall lamp fitting or something in there that you can put a daylight LED bulb into it doesn't necessarily have to be an official grow light because even an LED daylight bulb will offer some of the right spectrum for plants to grow. Ideally, an official grow light would, if you live in a place where you can get to an IKEA that sells the Vaxa range of grow lights, then you could try those. They're white, so you don't end up with your bathroom looking like a cannabis grow room. And you can also get your hands on LED grow lights, which are charged by either power packs or laptops or plugs with a USB socket. So that might be another way to go if you could have some of those on your plants and recharge them when necessary. That way you've got a more mobile setup. And I did have a look around on the internet and found some nice pictures of shelves with grow lights, strips of grow lights along the bottom of the shelf so that the shelf below is lit up. And that would be a really nice choice for a bathroom. Uh, you may need to get an electrician in to get that set up nicely for you and make it safe for a bathroom. But that is a really nice option. I'll put a link to a couple of those pictures in the show notes. Do bear in mind, though, if you are going to try to grow plants in a bathroom with no lateral light, you are going to need to leave those lights on roughly about 12 hours a day just so the plants get their fill and get to photosynthesize. So if you're just switching the light on and off to go in the bathroom, that's probably not going to be enough for the plants. It's easier if you can put things on a timer and then the light switch off and on automatically. I've got a timer for my grow lights here in the office. It's a really old-fashioned one. It's got a sort of a circular dial and you just push in the um, times where you want the timer the light to come on and when you want it to come off and it's very very straightforward but it works really really well because I find the ones with loads of buttons that you have to program endlessly to be a bit of a nightmare but get a timer and add that to your grow light setup and that will make life a hell of a lot easier for you and if you really have some money to throw at the problem, then you could turn to a company like Soltec Solutions, which has a track system for grow lights, which you could have on your ceiling. And that would look lovely and also give the proper light that your plants needed. And that one does come with a wall timer, so you don't have to worry about turning them on and off. Again, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. I've also come across a few plant hangers that actually double as lights so there's a light bulb above and then a hanging section below where you can add your plant so if you put a grow light bulb into one of those you could successfully grow something in the bathroom that way so in summary i think it's entirely possible to have a lovely plant filled bathroom without any window being present but you are going to have to work at it a little bit and come up with some solutions and fixes and depending on your budget, that might mean something quite simple, like the old switcheroo, or investing in some serious grow light kit. But I hope that's provided some inspiration, Julie. And if you've got a question for On The Ledge, drop me a line to ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com. That's it for this week's show i'll be back next friday but for now do remember to take care of yourself as well as your plants bye 
The music you heard in this week's episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, an instrument the boy called Happy Day Gakana by Samuel Corwin, and Quasi Motion by Kevin MacLeod. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. See my website for details. <laughs>